Thank you, Maeve, and thanks um, for having me as the, the speaker. It's good to see some familiar faces um, out in the audience today, and I hope we've got a lot of people tuning in live as well. Just so y'all know, I mean, this is the, it's the Waccamaw Conference, and just to put myself in the context of the Waccamaw, I live in Pauley's Island in uh, a neighborhood called Hagley, and I'm fortunate enough in my backyard to have a little natural tributary of the Waccamaw River. And so I feel incredibly blessed to live in this watershed, to be able to hop in my kayak and wander out to the Waccamaw and, and spend time there. It's really a blessing to, to live there. So that's just a little personal connection for me. Um, I have been practicing law for the past 20 years uh, with the South Carolina Environmental Law Project, or SCALP. Um, I'm, I'm double mic'd and I've got a remote control and a laptop, so bear with me as I navigate multiple different uh, technology platforms. So uh, we, we use, our mission is to use our legal expertise to protect land, water, and communities across South Carolina. Um, we have an amazing team. Lorraine Chow is um, with, uh, with uh, us here today and she, I have to give her thanks because she really helped put together today's presentation and I also want to give her a shout out because she's been our communications guru for the past three years and is getting ready to leave for California and so we are going to miss having a really powerful advocate on our team in South Carolina but we wish her, we wish her well. Um, and we have three or four focus areas and obviously I'm going to talk really specifically about the Clean Water Act today but I wanted y'all to just have a sense of the kind of work that we do. We're a public interest environmental organization and so we provide pro bono legal services to communities and groups that are trying to protect themselves uh, from environmental degradation and we do it in these different areas. Now, I, <laughs> I'm a lawyer, so you're going to hear a little bit of legal analysis and perspective, but I'm going to try not to do, dig, go too deep because uh, the Clean Water Act has been fraught with controversy since its enactment in, in 1972. Um, you know, we've all, we probably have all heard a lot about it because of the controversies that have been through the court system for decades. And I want to just give you a, a brief skimming of some of those because I think it's important to put in context where we were and how we got to where we are and thinking about where we're going in the future. Um, so, I, where, how did we get here? Many of us know uh, about the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland catching on fire. Uh, this is the 1969 fire, but th this was not the first time this river caught on fire, nor is it the first time that other rivers in our country caught on fire, and we were having um, really, really serious problems where we were treating our water bodies as our sewers, as our, the place where we are putting our uh, waste, industrial and municipal waste. And so it, it was really a wake up call in 1969 that we've got to do something different and we've got to do something better. Um, what was happening at that time, we, were, we had industrial and municipal waste that was getting discharged and sewage discharged directly into our waterways. No, no regulation, nobody was paying any attention to this. We are just dumping um, toxic pollutants and, and human waste into our water bodies. Um, we also saw massive fish kills. I mean, all across the country, we were seeing, um, this, this one just happens to be um, in, from Florida, 26 million fish dead because of the level of pollution that we were injecting into our waterways. We also had mass, have had massive loss of wetlands that led to the Clean Water Act. We're in Horry County, and a lot of what's happened in Horry County is massive, what we call drain, uh, draining wetlands. They've been, this is a, maybe kind of a classic example of what it looks like, digging a ditch through a wetland area, um, having the water drain out, and essentially converting that wetland into high ground so we can develop it on it. 
y'all living here know what's happened when we end up building in those areas. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. But we were trying to, we were trying to target this because we realized this was a problem. And across the country, whether it was draining wetlands for developing them or just filling them in, um, it, was, it was a massive problem that led, also led to the Clean Water Act. And, you know, I love the language. When I, when I was getting ready to talk with y'all, I went back and read some of the, the preamble to the Clean Water Act, which is really inspiring. Um, we had this bold vision for what we needed to do, and we set this objective of restoring and maintaining the chemical, physio physiological, or physical and biological integrity of our nation's waters. I mean, that, that's pretty, had a lot of foresight. And, and there were multiple goals that the act set, set out to how we were going to achieve this objective. And I don't want to talk about all of the goals, but I want to talk about the two or three goals that I think are the ones that Skelp really spends a lot of time focusing on and the ones that I think are the most powerful. And that having a goal of eliminating the discharge of pollutants into our water bodies by 1985. That was a goal. You can probably guess where things are heading in this talk because I think we probably all have opinions about whether we've achieved that goal. Uh, we also had a goal of achieving water quality levels that the support the protection and propagation of fish, shellfish, and wildlife and, pro and provide for recreation in and on the water by 1983. We want our waters fishable, swimmable. We want to be able to recreate in them. We want them to be safe and healthy for us by 1983 create and implement programs for the control of non-point sources of pollution, runoff uh, that we see associated with um, developments. Those kinds of programs were our goal. These are the goals. I mean, I, <laughs> and they haven't changed since 1972. So they're very laudable. And I think that, um, you know, we've, we've really come, a, certainly we have come a long way. We aren't in the same, you know, we're not dumping raw sewage into our water bodies. We do have some, some measure of control. And so we've, we've made a lot of progress from since the 1970s. But I would argue that there's still a really long way to go. And perhaps the act hasn't kept up with the changes that we're, we're seeing. Um, in those, you know, primarily we're talking about a climate crisis that we're facing and rapid population growth that have really altered the landscape from what it looked like in the 70s when we passed this law. So from Skelp's standpoint, um, we really uh, focus, I, I want to I um, talk about several tools that we use. I mean, we're, a, we're an environmental law organization. There are advocacy organizations that are doing really wonderful work. There's um, Susan Liebes started the program here at Coastal Carolina University, and we're, we're sitting here in Conway today um, doing a lot of work on water quality in the Waccamaw River. And so there have been a tremendous number of advocates. We've got the, uh, the river keeper here with us today. There have been some tremendous advocates that have used different tools provided by the Clean Water Act. I want to talk about the ones that Skelp uses. And so the Clean Water Act, one of the ways that the Act uh, implements this notion that we're going to not discharge pollutants into our waters anymore is it sets up a permitting program. So if you want to discharge a pollutant, which has got a definition and it can be sediments, it can be um, you know, waste, it's you know, any kind, anything that's contaminating the water body, those there's a legal definition for it um, and it could be you know fill dirt is a pollutant in wetlands and so using this 404 permitting program that requires an applicant to get a permit before they undertake that kind of an activity that's going to have a, uh, an impact on our on waters of the United States 
And then attached to that, there's a state level of protection with our 401 water quality certification program. So they're pretty powerful regulatory tools. Uh, there's also, there are also NPDES permits, uh, National Pollution Elimination Discharge Systems, and those cover a variety of activities um, from stormwater permits to discharges from industrial facilities. And, uh, and so that's another regulatory tool. And then finally, there's citizens enforcement provisions. So Congress gave you all and us the right to be able to enforce the Clean Water Act when people were breaking the law not following it. We don't have that similar provi provision in most state laws, um, but this, this is, is really powerful because it enables and empowers citizens to challenge violators. It also allows citizens to challenge government action that we believe violates the Clean Water Act as far as issuing a, a permit that doesn't meet the legal requirements. And, and so Skelp has gotten involved in quite a few of those citizen suits uh, over time. I, you know, I, I, I do, I, when I was getting ready to talk to, to y'all and knowing that this is the 50th anniversary and wanting to celebrate the passage of this, this really landmark piece of legislation, I, you know, I had to really give it some thought because while we've achieved a lot of really great successes, the reality is that I think, you know, I think, I, I think we probably can all agree that some, those goals that I shared earlier just haven't been met. And so I, I hope that um, we, what I want to leave with today is this understanding that we've got a really powerful tool that's done a lot in, its, in, its, in these past 50 years, but there is a long way to go. Uh, we certainly don't have rivers catching on, far, on fire, but maintaining and restoring that connectivity has not, has not happened. Um, you know, one of the, so this, this is the, the little diversion into uh, law school, uh, 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 legal education that I'm going to give you. We're going to try not to go super deep into it, but one of the most controversial things about the Clean Water Act is what is regulated. Because the law says you can't discharge pollutants into waters of the United States. What are waters of the United States? <laughs> we, there, there has been some, you know, They've been defined as navigable waters, but then again, wetlands aren't navigable, so it extends beyond that. And really, there isn't a definition that Congress has given, and it's been left to the courts to determine. So navigable waters are waters of the United States, <laughs> but what does that mean? So there have been cases, um, let's see, probably the first one starting out, I want to make sure I don't get my notes too messed up, but um, 1985 was one of the first cases that the court really grappled with this question of what are navigable waters, what are waters of the states that are regulated. And it really comes down to you know, how we are going to determine jurisdiction of wetlands. Um, the most recent, there, and there have been multiple cases over the years, the Solid Waste Agency of Northern Cook County in 2001, and then there was this Rapanos decision that came out um, around 2006, I think it was. And there was a, um, a split decision by the U.S. Supreme Court, as a lot of these cases end up being very controversial. They're split decisions, and this, this generally is the rule that's still in place. Y'all may have read about the Trump rule 
Um, the, the waters of the WOTUS rule is what we called it. There's the navigable waters rule. There are, have been um, a lot of work done to change the rules and the, how we define wetlands, and they're extremely complicated. The most recent um, iteration of the, well, not the most recent, but the, the WOTUS rule received over one million comments for people that were, had something to say about how we're defining waters of the U.S. But generally the, te the test, and I, I want to put this up because I want y'all to get a flavor of how complicated it is. Uh, the Rapanos decision set out two different tests. One is this relatively permanent waters test. And so uh, relatively permanent standing or continuously flowing bodies of water and wetlands with a continuous surface connection to such waters. That's one, one part of the test. Then there's if the waters are truly navigable or if they're not truly navigable but nevertheless relatively permanent, they're jurisdictional, and wetlands emerging directly from other, e either of those two are also jurisdictional. And then if there's a, there, there's a separate test, the significant nexus test. And it's wetlands that alone or in combination with similarly situated lands significantly affect the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of truly navigable waters. I mean, I think that this is where we, uh, most people land after reading that definition. And this is just really the tip of the iceberg because the uh, legal machinations over how we define these and what qualifies has been extremely um, con controversial and contested. So that is it for the, the law school class part. <laughs> um, I just wanted people to understand that these, I think a lot of us go out and think we know a wetland when you see it and assume that those are, areas are protected. And the reality is that they are not very often protected. It's only if they fall under, only if the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers determines that they meet this complicated definition of waters of the state. And it's in so much flux that the Corps is kind of on a roller coaster ride of what definition do they even use and how do they define these systems. So it's, um, I think, <laughs> we get questions a lot from people saying, you know, they're filling in wetlands down the street from me or nearby or, and, and we think that we know, we, we assume because they look wet and they've got wetland vegetation in them that it's automatically illegal. And it's, it, it's the, the sad news is that it's just, it's not, that's not the case, unfortunately. And a lot of these wetlands slip through the cracks and don't, don't have the protections that they need. And we're, we're going to get to like why that is important in, in, just, um, in just a minute. But I think um, just as an example one of, our, of one of our cases where we had this question of, are these wetlands and waters jurisdictional or, or not? And is a permit required or not? came up in our Deerfield case. And I bring it up because Deerfield is in Horry County. Um, it is a little south of us. It doesn't actually drain in, the system actually drains into the Atlantic Ocean and not the Waccamaw River. But it is a good example of how, of the struggles that we have in trying to protect wetland systems. I'll grant you that it's not the warm, fuzzy wetland system that maybe we all think of because this is a, system that evolved because there were there was there's a development with a golf co course within it and of course the golf course was built on filled in wetlands and then some of these natural systems remained throughout the golf course it stopped being used as a golf course and started reverting back to, back to its natural system and then a developer came in and said, you know, I'd like to just, let, let's just, you know, pave over this whole thing and do a development on top of the golf course. So we, um, the, the Corps, Army Corps of Engineers that regulates wetlands, used that complicated definition and said, these, none of these are wetlands. They're not 
jurisdictional under the, by the Corps' definition. And so proceed with your development plan. So we, we used the citizen suit enforcement provision and we challenged uh, whether these wetlands were jurisdictional or not. And you know, I just, I wanted to bring some of these, show you some of these pictures, because I think it's really, when I, when I mentioned that some of us go out and we have an idea of a, what a wetland looks like or what a jurisdictional area looks like, or what we think would be protected under the law. These are areas that I think, that's how we felt when we looked at them, that you've got, you've got um, actual you know, water in a system that's a conduit carrying it through, um, through the system into a lake that feeds directly into the Atlantic Ocean. So there's connectivity all the way out to the Atlantic Ocean and no dispute that that is a water of the United States. <laughs> So we've got the Corps saying, the Corps of Engineers told us there's a difference between these two points where the arrows are. One is, one is jurisdictional and the other is not. And they're, this is how close they are to each other. Again, this is where they say, at this point, jurisdiction just automatically arises in the middle of a, a continuously running stream <laughs> that's got what we call relatively permanent flow um, under that the definition that I mentioned earlier so it's just um, it's it's very I mean my sense when I saw all these is that it's kind of arbitrary it's had who, who is to say on one side or the other that there's a difference if there's if there's pollution going in upstream it's okay and legal, and if it's going down just a couple feet, all of a sudden it becomes not legal. This is all a connected system. This just shows, you know, again, the, the, how much water is involved and that there's, there are conveyances that this whole is all connected to one, one system, but the Corps of Engineers said this is, not, this is not a water of the state, it's not protected, and you can go ahead and fill it in. So, <laughs> why does all that matter? Why does it matter? Well, wetlands do a lot for us. I mean, we're, we're in really the center of a place that has experienced what happens when we don't protect wetlands and we, we allow development to occur in wetland areas and then we see what happens, which is a pretty extensive flooding. So, I mean, one of the most important um, functions at wetland, well, they, they provide a lot of important functions, but in this area, and as we're facing the impacts of, of rising seas and climate change, more severe weather events, more intense rain events, we're seeing more flooding, and these wetlands are like sponges. I mean, they, they hold and soak up floodwaters, so they per perform that function. They are like nature's kidneys. They are able to um, soak up pollutants um, and filter them out. Uh, they're, they be, they're so effective at this filtering function that they have been, they've been used more as a way to treat water. And so improving their, their constructed wetlands have been used as water quality treatment measure. Um, personal to me, because I, I, love, I love watching birds and wildlife, is, is the habitat function that they provide. So from um, providing you know, spawning grounds for all kinds of fish and um, marine life and, and things like spotted salamanders and that have specific habitat requirements. Wetlands are really just a very active place for, for these kinds of species. And so, that, so they're, they're, they play really you know, very important functions and values. And, but in South, in South Carolina, roughly 20% of our land is actually wetlands and the vast majority of that is in the coastal plain. I think the coastal plain contains something like 90% of all of our state's wetlands. It's a really high number. 
So the, moving a little outside of our watershed, this is the angel oak tree. And the reason I wanted to show you the angel oak and talk about it a little bit is because I mentioned this 401 water quality certification process that we have. The Clean Water Act gives the states certain responsibilities uh, and, and delegates these, uh, this authority for the state to protect water quality. And so there's an important role that the state plays under the Clean Water Act. And one of those roles is, is looking to see whether a project is going to harm our water quality standards, whether it's going to harm aquatic ecosystems, whether it's going to change the functions and values of, of a wetland system. And so when there was a proposal to, it's maybe a little bit hard to see, but the road kind of running through the middle that, that curves down to the right as it goes off the screen, up in there is where the Angel Oak is. And there is 42, there's 42 acres around the Angel Oak and a, a tributary system that's directly connected to the river at the bottom. And the, the proponent of the project wanted to develop that whole 42 acres, clear all of the trees, fill in the wetland system that leads out to the larger creek, and, and do a development there. And so we used our states, they had, to, they had to get both a Clean Water Act 404 permit and this 401 water quality certification. So we challenged the 401 water quality certification, a Clean Water Act requirement, and said, wait a second, this is going to de degrade water quality by eliminate, completely eliminating this wetland and creek system running through this 42 acre property. It was very contentious um, and we were in in the middle of our appeal when the developer actually went bankrupt. The bank brought, bought the project and negotiated a settlement with us where we ended up being able to secure protection of the whole 42 acres. But it was because we had that tool that we were able to bring the legal challenge and we went to court and had a, had a trial with experts and litigated the case in a way that gave us the opportunity to settle it and, and make sure that the Angel Oak was protected successfully. Um, we also recently, working with the Charleston Waterkeeper, um, worked to uh, improve water quality standards. So again, the state has, has that authority. They, they implement water quality standards that say, what level of protection are we going to give to our water bodies? And the, the highest class is, is um, well, it's outstanding resource waters, but we have, they're called SA and SB waters and they say how much pollution can be in waters that we swim in and recreate in. And they had two different standards <laughs> of saltwater recreational um, levels of pollution that, were, uh, that could exist. And so we fought to get those heightened protections for all of our salt, salt water, um, water bodies. And so we were, we were successful. We petitioned DHEC. We asked them to increase these water quality standards for recreational uses in our, our salt waters. Um, it was a, it, an important tool f under the Clean Water Act and so had that rule change um, became effective just, effective just last year. Um, changing tack a little bit to back to freshwater um, and these NPDES permits. So we have three coal-fired power plants in the state that had been operating or have been operating under these pollution discharge permits under the Clean Water Act uh, for the Winya generating station, which is in Georgetown, just down the road, um, the Cross station, and the Watery station. 
Now, these permits have to be renewed regularly, but DHEC, our state regulatory agency, had let the pollution control permits, the, the discharge that's coming out of these facilities that uh, regulates the level of pollution that's acceptable to discharge into a receiving body, they had expired between 10 and 12 years ago. Now it's probably you know 11 and 13 years ago because we keep you know going on, um, but it's a, an important tool for us to make sure that what's what we're discharging into our waters is is acceptable, and so we brought a challenge, uh, asking the court to order DHEC to act on these old expired permits, and I. It's a little bit of an aside from water quality issues, but our, our main goal here is to you know, ultimately see the retirement of these dirty fossil fuel facilities. That's the end game, really, but as long as they are operating, we believe that we should be requiring those facilities to meet today's standards, the more, the, the most stringent standards that, that um, we can, and to, keep up with the current technology and make sure that we're, we're trying to strive towards that goal of eliminating pollution into our waterways. So we, it, it, most of the time, these, our cases are protracted legal battles that take years to resolve. Um, and this was probably the most unique case because in that regard because we filed our complaint saying court tell DHEC that they need to act on these expired pollution permits and within a couple of weeks of filing our complaint DHEC called us up and said uh, you know <clears throat> you're right <laughs> we we should have done this we haven't done it and can we can we work out a timeline with you with y'all where we agree to, to reviewing and acting on these permits. Um, they, and so we settled the case relatively quickly. Uh, the draft permits have been issued and we're not really satisfied with those draft permits. Although, at least for the Winya facility, should be, um, be moving into retirement within the next several years. And already some of it's operations have have been shut down so it's still something that's in progress but again another really powerful tool to be able to say we need to we need to meet the legal requirements for permitting discharges under the Clean Water Act um, this is just a, an image of the cross facility so you can see I mean there these facilities are all adjacent to water bodies they all are discharging into the the, the adjacent waterway you all know from the the plant up here about the the <laughs> the problems with the coal ash in the ponds and um, something that my friends at Southern Environmental Law Center worked on uh, getting remediation for that um, for those coal ash ponds um, I also so, so I talked about some some of these permitting matters but there's also what do you do when you find out that somebody is illegally polluting the waters this is a not, case not not near to us we're a statewide organization so we're, we work all over the state but we were uh, clued in to uh, an event venue up in Pickens County that had in woefully mismanaged a con its construction site that the, the, the topography there obviously is a lot different than here and uh, with you know, with the the hills and the mountain, the foot being in the foothills, there's a lot of elevation, and so they had taken no measures to prevent all of the sediment from running off the site. And as a result, there was massive amounts of sediment flushing into the East Tatoe River, into protected trout streams. I mean, the water quality that trout need is very, very high. They have to have clear, clear and cold waters for their survival. And when they get junked up 
with sediments like what happened here. And so these are two of the images uh, of that, that level of pollution. It's, it's, it's detrimental. Um, and so we filed a Clean Water Act citizen suit. The case was dismissed by Judge Dawson, who is Obama or who is Trump's appointee in to the federal court in South Carolina, and so we are now we've now appealed that case to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, and one of our lawyers, Mike uh, Martinez, will be arguing in the Fourth Circuit in in May to try and get the court to acknowledge that we've we need to hold violators of the law accountable. That's, that's what the purposes of the Clean Water Act, citizen suit enforcement provision, and it, this tool can be very powerful when it's used in the right way. So a little bit more to come on that. Um, <laughs> obviously, you know, I've, I've hinted at this, <laughs> Through, through the talk, but you know, where, where are we on our, our goals? I mean, I'd, I would say our work is far from over. And not only is it far from over, what do we need more? What, what we, we've got this law, it's been very powerful. Skelp and many others have used it very successfully in a lot of different cases but we still see problems like on Deerfield when you can fill in all of those waters and, and um, wetland systems. We still see you know, lots of pollution, um, old expired permits, approvals of things that are, are harming the environment by either filling in wetlands, allowing pollutant discharge into our waterways. And so I would say we still have a a long way to go to make sure that our waters are, are fishable and swimmable. I, just to, to put up some, put, put that into context, um, you know, 50 years later we still have a lot of challenges. Around half of all the lakes and rivers uh, across the country um, fail to meet the, the water quality standards. Um, waters are classified as impaired, meaning that their their fish are inedible. You can't swim in them. They're undrink. You can't drink the water, um, and they they don't support aquatic life. So we in, in South Carolina, we're seeing an, an upward t trend of these waters. They're not going down. We have this state has a requirement to maintain what, what they call a 303D list. It's Section, section 303D of the Clean Water Act that says we need to identify what water bodies are impaired and what they're impaired for. And we need to keep a list of those because we need to be moving towards getting them off impairment. But in South Carolina, the trend of impaired waters is an upward trend. So I, I want to leave with really prob probably the, you know, hopefully, hopefully a good amount of hope and optimism, but also a, a level of recognition that we all, we need to do better. And instead of being despondent, which is, I acknowledge is really easy to do, and it feels like wanting to throw up your hands a lot of times because of the the battles are so great but they're also so great and and so important that we all do our part in making sure that we strive keep striving towards that goal of fishable and swimmable waters and waters that we can all recreate in so i you know i think absolutely being a watchdog in your community is is an an essential step. I mean, I, I remember when the the uh, Waccamaw Waterkeeper program first started, and my friend Hamp Shooping was there, and I, some of you in the audience know Hamp really well, and he was out on the water, had a cadre of volunteers that were out there monitoring and looking and reporting when they saw problems, and I, I mentioned him just because I remember when we, he actually found 
uh, an illegal discharge and reported it. The, op, the owner didn't know, and it was it was remedied. But there was junk coming out of off off of a site into the Waccamaw River, and because of that monitoring, it was fixed. Those are the kinds of things y'all are doing. I know you're monitoring the river, but I'm encouraging. I, I'm talking to Kara, the river keeper. Uh, the, <laughs> Um, but but us as individuals, when you're when you're out on, on, on the water, when you're in your communities, you know, being aware and, and cognizant of that what's happening because it takes us all looking after our communities. We can't expect the federal government to do it. We can't expect the state government to do it. We need to hold them accountable, and we need to be making sure that we're paying attention. I know um, I see. The other, you know, Amelia Wood in the audience who's been um, really a watchdog over Horry County Solid Waste Authority and the, the, the landfill expansions that they've proposed in Starrett Swamp, which is a really incredibly valuable wetland system and having, you know, her, her engagement is a great example of making sure that we're watching what's happening and holding our um, elected officials and appointed officials accountable. You know, I, think we, I think we need to talk about it more. Honestly, we need to talk to our friends in our communities. There, it's, it's important that we are all on the same page about where things stand and only by talking about them and raising the awareness and making sure that people, it's on their radar because there's so many things that are competing for our attention, but it's when, when they really are elevated because people are, it's in their mind, it's in their consciousness. And so I would encourage y'all to, to do that as well and, and, and be talking about this with your family and friends. And, um, you know, did, did y'all know where we are? Did you know that our, our water quality is actually getting worse and we're experiencing significant loss of our wetland systems? Um, and, and that can also lead to things like letters to the editor or um, you know, things like that where you're, you're expressing your views because I think the, the alternative is there's only one view that's heard or one perspective that's heard and we need to hear all. And of course, asking our elected officials to do better. The, the general consensus about getting improvements to the Clean Water Act itself is that it's probably pretty unlikely that we're going to get there with Congress. But at the state level, there can be things done, um, and certainly at the local level. And I, I want to just touch on both. One, first, starting with the state level, um, our, in 2020, the legislature passed a law that requires all municipalities to have a resiliency element as part of our comprehensive plans. And so, and, and the resilience element needs to look at how we're gonna handle things like flooding and how we're gonna be, how we're gonna prepare for sea level rise and how we're gonna protect our communities from those things. And so that gives a really valuable opportunity for a recognition at the municipal level, at the city and county level, about the the importance of wetlands in in resilience, and it it would be my great hope that out of these resiliency elements, we can drive some changes like uh, f for better wetlands protection at the local level, uh, because it I think. You know, being here again, you know, up in Horry County again, and just having witnessed what's happened with the, you know, the the great community community engagement over the, the impacts of flooding that we've experienced, and the need to really stop filling in our wetland systems and start allowing them to be those buffers that we that we really need. And I, I, I've been following, and some of the Maeve and some other people are, are on a wetlands working group with me at, that we're really trying to advocate and support for those greater protections at the local level. 
And so when you, you know, hear about those things, become aware of them, going to county council meetings before planning commission and engaging when there are those opportunities to say, hey, you, we need to do better and, and demanding that and, and, and speaking out um, whether it's at a public hearing or whether it's you know, sending in letters, but we, they're only, our elected officials are only going to be accountable if we hold them accountable. So um, I enc encourage you all to think about that as, those, are, those as ways to continue to get involved. Um, and I think what I'll leave you with is the last, you know, one way to also stay just in, in the know is, you know, we welcome people that aren't already on our um, e-news e list to, to sign up and um, you can obviously report an issue and on our, through our website. We've got a help request form where we try and give citizens the tools that they need to, to um, help solve issues that they, you know, problems that they are aware of. Um, many of y'all already know how to get in touch with me and we've, we've been in contact on a number of issues over, over time. Um, but also we, we have a, a monthly e-news that we're glad for people to um, sign up for just to stay involved with some of the issues that we're working on, which a lot of them are related to water and water quality in wetlands and some of them aren't. Um, so I, I'm gonna, that's, that's really where I was landing and I wanted to, but I did want to give folks an opportunity um, for some questions. We've got a little bit of time left. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.